Courageous Conversations was launched in 2020 in the midst of the racial reckoning following the death of George Floyd, Regis Korpinski Parkett. In order to have conversations around difficult and contentious issues that were happening and around which we needed to increase knowledge and awareness, so for example, around systemic racism, around racial profiling, um, and around efforts to come to terms with what is to be done. We found two people who inspired these kinds of conversations historically and today, one of whom is Violet King, a Calgarian who became the first black woman lawyer, and the other was Maya Angelou, the African-American author and poet who said that courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you cannot do anything else consistently. What inspires me is having the conversations with these leading thinkers from across campus, the country and around the world, who have been thinking deeply about these issues, who have been engaged with uh, social justice movements, with university communities, with other intellectuals and activists, with an aim not just for understanding, but also for thinking about how the understanding can be mobilized in order to affect sustainable change. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Melinda Smith, and I am the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Calgary. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to this third uh, session in this Fall Courageous Conversation speaker series. Courageous Conversation, as the video highlighted, is a series that's designed to grapple with contentious issues, to tackle difficult conversations, to spark honest and challenging dialogue uh, needed and necessary uh, in the university and in society more broadly. These difficult conversations we know are necessary if we are to ever think about achieving a more equitable, just and inclusive university and society more broadly. These conversations are necessary to think about how we have more equitable uh, and inclusive teaching and learning spaces, research and scholarship, and community engagement. These kinds of conversations and the push to think about moving from talk to action are just one aspect of the anti-racism, equity, diversity, inclusion, accessibility, uh, uh, literacy, education, and awareness taking place through the Office of Equity, Diversity, Inclusion, and at the university more broadly. But I would like to, before we move any further into our conversation, I would like to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from Calgary. And I would like to take this opportunity to, to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region in Southern Alberta, which includes the Blackfoot Confederacy, comprising the Siksika, the Piguni, and the Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chinaki Bear, Bears Paw and Wesley's First Nation. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta, Region 3. Today, we are focusing on the topic of anti-racism and decolonization in the university. And it is our distinct honor to welcome two internationally renowned speakers, Dr. Vernon St. Denis from the University of Saskatchewan and Dr. Shirley Ann Tate from the University of Alberta. 
Also joining us today is my colleague and our second moderator, Dr. Aruna Srivastava, a professor of English at the University of Calgary and also an EDIA equity a leader in the Office of Equity, Diversity and Inclusion here at the University of Calgary. I'd like to start this important conversation today with a blessing. We are fortunate to have with us Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle, who is uh, the elder who serves with us and, and engages with us through the whole series around uh, decolonization and questions of justice in the university. Elder Sitting Eagle is a language instructor at the Sisica Outreach School. Uh, Sisica is on Treaty 7 land, and she is one of the very important leaders, leaders to our treaty community. She has worked as a researcher in the Blackfoot Crossing Historical Park and has, has been employed with the Sisica culture and heritage community. She has traditional knowledge and insights on ways of being and doing that are important to us uh, in our journey towards reconciliation and to our conversations around anti-racism and decolonization. We are honored to have her here today. Also, I would like to note, she's a proud mother of three and a grandmother of eight. We know she's a very busy woman. Elder Sydney Eagle, would you please start our discussion with a blessing and we, and so that we can engage together in a good way. And I wanna thank you very much for doing so. Okay, get to connect to my friend, I'm going to go. And I'm going to say that 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 I'm Okay. <laughs> So I'm going to, I'm just going to give you a brief uh, opening remarks. I, I have, um, like I said, I work at the Sixka Outreach School. So I just finished cooking with the students and um, uh, I have to leave here quick to go pick up a student that needs a ride into school. So I'm a, like um, Melinda said, I'm a very busy woman, but I take time to share what I can with, with all of you. In my prayer, I talked about, um, working with people such as all of you that are in, in attendance today, that all your loved ones be blessed with the hands of our creator, that whatever endeavors we have, that they, they follow through. And whatever is placed in front of us, be made easy with the, with the blessings of our creator. So, the, t the topics that have been talked about while I've been here, they've um, talked about many avenues that Six God Nation is, is dealing with at, at the moment. Uh, sad to say, we just lost our oldest elderly woman this morning. Um, her age is indefinite because a lot of our registries weren't correct, but my condolences to, to her family. So. Oh, excuse me. So when you talk about racism, anti-racism, here in Siksika, there is racism within the communities on our reserve. 
I know it, it's kind of uh, strange to hear that, but we often hear the word, um, the rich against the poor. This one isn't that kind of a battle. It's more like uh, we are fighting a holy battle here in Siksiba, where we have holy societies that um, um, have placed themselves above every, everything. And then there's the, you know, just the regular Siksiga members that attend these ceremonies for blessings. But a lot of times we, we mix up these two and think we're, I guess we're above everybody else. So that's a little bit of uh, the racism that we're working on. The discrim it's more like discrimination, I would say. Um, so in the past, I mentioned that my goal is to raise the Siksika language fluency within Siksika. We have 8,000 people in our, in our membership. 592 of those are fluent in the Siksika language. I teach here and I'm hoping that, you know, once the, my students leave Siksika Outreach School, that they can converse in Siksika not just knowing the colors or numbers or animals, but to actually converse in our language. So I teach them every day how to put the sentences together, how to use the sentences. And just uh, like I said, we've been cooking. I even bring the cooking uh, into, into their cooking class. We've made crackling. It's rendered beef fat that was uh, it was a uh, now it's a delicacy before it was normal it was a normal thing that people would do alongside their their bannock or um so that's what we teach and that's what we share with our children and um i know i'm kind of rushing but uh there's a student waiting for me to get picked up but i will join you when i return i will join i will join in and if there's any questions or um, anything that that you need to ask of me, um, more you're more I'm more than happy to to share with you. So, so thank you. Thank you, and I want to give you uh, this tobacco as a thank you uh, for not only being here today, but being part of the entire series and engaging with the communities here and around the world uh, who have participated in this series. So we all coming from different places in this in the midst of this pandemic, but rest assured that uh, we will get this to you uh, in a timely manner. So thank you very, very much. Thank you. And see you soon. <clears throat> so today's panel, uh, as Elder Sitting Eagle highlighted, is going to delve deeper into the question of anti-racism and decolonization in the university. Um, this, these are centuries old questions, really, the intersection of anti-racism and colonialism uh, and how they have been embedded in societies uh, generally. My view, if you, <clears throat> you look at the early works of Amy Cizas, Fanon, um, any of the early decolonization scholars in Africa or across Latin America, the decolonial de de schools in uh, and subaltern schools in Asia and decolonial schools in uh, Latin America, anti-racism has been inextricably connected to the work of decolonization. So one, but one of the questions we have in, in terms of territory and place is also, is it possible to decolonize and indigenize the university itself, this institution we've inherited from the colonial period or the disciplines that we have inherited from, uh, uh, from, from Europe and, and the kind of reading list and, uh, and requirements. Is it possible to decolonize and also to indigenize? And are they similar and how are they interconnected? Anti-racism is an essential part of decolonial thinking, knowledge, create knowledge creation, production, construction, and practices, but also ways of knowing and being in the academy. So it is a necessary building block of transformation of the universities. Um, and so 
part of that too is also, as we will hear in this, uh, the speakers today, is actually confronting the issue of whiteness as a structure of domination in the institution and, and, and thinking about how not to replace one form of domination with another. So, so before we, I, we launch any further into discussion, let me introduce our first speaker who will begin to take up these issues for us. Our first panelist is Dr. Verna Sundini, a professor of education in the Department of Educational Foundation and the special advisor to the president on anti, of, of the University of Saskatchewan on anti-racism and anti-oppression at the University of Saskatchewan, where she has taught undergraduate and graduate courses in critical thinking, uh, critical and intersecting anti-racism education, and that she's written extensively on the, in this area since the early 90s. Dr. Sindhani identifies as both Cree and Métis, and she's a member of the Beardies and Okamasa's First Nation. I will now turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Werner Sindhani. Thank you very much for being here. Thank you. Uh... Thank you, Melinda. I'm just trying to share my screen. Okay, well, um, uh, thank you uh, to Elder uh, Colleen uh, for those blessings. And um, I, um, I come to this conversation from the perspective of an Indigenous woman and a member of Okamasis and Beauties and Okamasis First Nations and a childhood experience of growing up as a non-status Métis born on road allowance on the borders of First Nations Métis white settler communities. I gained uh, access to a university education through the Indian Teacher Education Program, uh, which is an affirmative action or equity avenue into the university. And as a faculty in the early 90s, um, I was tasked with the um, I was tasked with developing the first required cross-cultural uh, First Nations education course for all undergraduate students. And so uh, my, um, my observations about um, a cultural analysis versus a race analysis is, is born in part from that experience. And so, um, so drawing on those experiences, particularly from a College of Education perspective, a profession that impacts all Canadian citizens as public education uh, requires mandatory attendance, I've witnessed uh, the importance and shortcomings of university education that fails to take seriously the experiences of racialized people and Indigenous people in this country. And um, and speaking from that, from a faculty of education location, I, uh, we need to address racism directly, not subsumed under a culturally responsive framework. So often uh, examining the cultural diversity of our students and citizens serves as a decoy from examining the history of, um, of white racism. And it's too often that culturally diversity approach is too often used as a strategy to avoid examining the embeddedness of whiteness in higher education. And so um, that's a little bit of my, my talk is to look at um, how thinking about cultural difference is the default position for not talking about race and avoiding the charge of racism. And here I'm drawing on the work of um, Alana Linton. And, um, and so um, the question of what constitutes decolonizing education is a question we've long asked in Indigenous education. And again, I'm referring to education in the K-12 system and the barriers um, to exercising self-determination in, in, in Indigenous education has always been hampered by government policy that we submit ourselves to pedagogies of colonial education. And so as an anti-racist educator, I focused on the discourses of culture 
and how they work to erase the impact of racism and white supremacy in the Canadian public. And so I'm interested in how this concept of culture came to replace the language of uh, race in the aftermath of Holocaust. So I share that um, interest with Elana Linton. And here I'm citing from her publication in 2005. She argues that merely replacing race with culture failed to expunge the ranking of human humanity implied by theories of race. And she argues that the shift from race to culture or ethnicity is little more than a cosmetic one in terms of the impact it has on actual experience of uh, racism. So the shift I think has, uh, we see the, the repercussions of the uh, denial in our society. And so for example, last summer, our uh, RCMP commissioner declared that we don't have systemic racism or they don't have systemic racism within the police force. And uh, Goldberg already observed earlier that this notion that there's, not, there's no racism builds on the Eurocentric uh, definition of um, racism and it severs, it, it's a severing from a basis in colonial rule. So how does this denial of racism impact our decolonizing Indigenous efforts? Is it really possible to decolonize the academy without acknowledging and being anti-racist in all academic areas? So often our decolonizing efforts don't name racism or colonial violence directly. So for example, uh, in the USASC website, decolonizing and indigenizing are described in these ways. So indigenizing the um, uh, academy describes it as uh, incorporating, including, and adding, and preserving, and valuing. And um, I just wonder like how much will change and how far can we go by our inclusion? And what are the costs of integrating? And what are the challenges of our incorporation into a profoundly colonial institution? Is it possible to transform colonial institutions? And what does that require? As a beginning, we need critical anti-colonial and anti-racist education. And our website also contains statements on what it means to decolonize. Um, and these include uh, breaking down and dismantling barriers uh, that prevent indigenous people from prospering, engaging in critical reflection. So if in decolonizing, we are talking about barriers or critical reflection on colonial history and its systemic effects, then we need a critique of white supremacy and whiteness as it operates in our institutions. But it seems easier to talk about indigenizing and affirming cultural differences and appreciating cultural awareness. My doctoral research over two decades ago sought to understand how a cultural difference analysis came to dominate the framework for understanding the challenges that we faced in uh, Indigenous education. So really continuing with this question of how did the concept of culture come to replace the language of race in the aftermath of the Holocaust? And again, um, Linton ties this to the UNESCO project that intended to undermine the scientific credentials of the race concept but it didn't address the political implications of racism in the history of the West. It failed to deal with the important fact that while race thinking may have had its beginnings in the scientific or philosophical domain, it was through the medium of politics that it has been propelled to significance. So, um, so while this statement of UNESCO on race and racial prejudice recognized as Alana observes the condition of conquest that the con that the colonial conditions of conquest contributed to racism. This did not entail any analysis or agency on the part of the colonial state, and this has had consequences, I think, for um, indigenous people in Canada. And we can see the shift to a cultural discourse in government policy. And that's part of what I've traced in terms of its impact 
um, on Indigenous education. So, for example, the Hawthorne Report, which was like a comprehensive study of Indians in Canada, um, there were two volumes, and the first volume affirmed the special status that Indigenous people or First Nations Indians had in Canada, but the second volume looked at what was the state of affairs in terms of the increasing enrollment of Indigenous people into public education in Canada. And, uh, and, the, and the, the report uh, acknowledged that, that there was challenges, and, uh, but they also recommend strategies out of the low academic achievement. And they suggest that the Indian must be brought to a greater awareness of what he once was. And that we have to free ourselves from shackles of poverty and cultural exclusion and retrieve our pride and dignity. And when I, I read that uh, uh, history or that report, you know, many decades ago, but then to come back at it, at again through um, an understanding of how cultural discourses have been co-opted. Um, and so this, this uh, remedy of responding to what at that time uh, was acknowledged that in, Indigenous kids were not welcome in public education. And so we see this, um, this shift uh, from using cultural pride and positive identity to eradicate, you know, this, uh, we see uh, a shift in policy from eradicating indigeneity to affirming indigenous indigeneity. And, um, and so we see this uh, um, again in Indian control of Indian education. Um, in which uh, many of the statements that it makes, but the one that I that I return to over and over again is uh, one that um, explains that unless a child learns about the forces which shape him, the history of his people, their values and customs, their language, he will never know himself or his potential as a human being. And so, um, um, and so this was, you know, very empowering, but the way in which that I've also interpreted it as time has gone on is to say, what are those forces which shape them? And at the same time, um, um, I was reading and we're reading the scholarship of Métis scholars and, and uh, community activists. And so in those uh, early years of my uh, becoming um, conscious of, uh, of the impact of colonialism on our communities, I read Maria Campbell's book uh, in which she observes and, and, and uh, explains uh, the challenges that faced us as Métis people, you know, recognizing that the white man tried to make you hate your people, that they make you hate who you are. And that was the first time in like 12, 12 years of education that I encountered uh, a recognition or I recognized or I identified with, with a piece of literature. And so it validated that experience that we have in Canadian society of, of being uh, inferiorized. And then shortly after that, I was introduced to the work of Howard Adams. And in his text, um, his anti-colonial, anti-racist uh, text, uh, Prison of Grass, he observes that as soon as um, Native children enter school, they are surrounded by white supremacist ideas and stories. Every image glorifies white success. They are unable to resist it. Um, they become conditioned to accept inferiority as a natural way of life. And they soon recognize that all positions of authority, such as teacher, priest, judge, Indian agent, are held by whites. They make all the rules. Um, so for me, despite this anti-colonial and anti-racist analysis from 1975, cultural discourses have continued to dominate within Indigenous education. And more recently, I have valued and appreciated the work of um, scholar Aileen Morton Robson, who also um, urges us in Indigenous studies to consider um, to consider moving Indigenous studies be beyond cultural difference 
to an exploration of whiteness and race. And, uh, <clears throat> and so in part, you know, I would argue, uh, you know, that as Fanon observed a few decades ago, that um, we try to convince the colonizers that we are human beings. And when I read Fanon and he does a critique of the, some of the strategies towards decolonizing that we make, he made this observation that we'll never, we will never make colonialism blush for shame by spreading out our little known cultural tra treasures under its eyes. And um, so to think about like, how do we decolonize an institution that is deeply embedded in, in colonialism and how is that our task to convince colonizers that we're human, that we have a, our cultural traditions that are worthy of maintaining? And, um, and, and how does that keep us from, from acknowledging and exploring and examining the role of whiteness in our, in our, uh, in our lives? And so more recently, in uh, Métis scholar Chris Anderson recognized in his in his 2009 article that we need to be teaching about whiteness, how whiteness frames indigeneity and how indigenous people know whiteness should stand as a central component of the discipline of indigenous studies. A sophisticated indigenous studies discipline must focus on uh, indigenous communities as a critique of colonial society. So these two pro approaches have consequences for identity construction of white settlers. And, um, and one way in which I get that, I get at that in terms of thinking about what's, what does a culturally relevant approach do and what does an anti-racist uh, approach do? And how, how are they productive of non-Indigenous settler identities? And uh, one way in which, um, uh, my colleague, uh, Dr. Carol Schick and I have uh, explored this is by looking at um, who are non-Indigenous people in anti-racist education? Well, they're implicated in oppression, they're seen as colonizers, recognized as colonizers, beneficiaries of colonial violence, unfairly advantaged, engaged in practicing genocide, perpetrators of inequality, thieves and liars, stolen children, stolen land, required to be accountable, required to be honest and responsible. And in a, uh, a not uh, culturally a responsive pro approach, who, how are they positioned? How are non-Indigenous position, people positioned as admirers, spectators, consumers, helpers and saviors, passive innocent bystanders uh, without a history of colonialism? not implicated and not responsible in ongoing inequality, not asked to make changes. The ideology of superiority and inferiority are not um, disrupted. And so, um, <clears throat> so that um, growing recognition that these uh, uh, two approaches require a very different investment from settler colonialism. And again, this is observed by Hawaiian scholar uh, Keo Mio, who uh, observed, you know, uh, that, um, and she, here she's looking at like state mandated Hawaiian studies in Hawaii. And she went in and, and did research on how is that being, how is that being um, practiced? And she made these observations that schools offer benign lessons in Hawaiian arts, crafts, and values, but it tends to erase Hawaiian suffering, hardship, and oppression. And she asks that we need to tell more uncomfortable stories and uh, that un those uncomfortable stories include acknowledging white supremacy that devalues the lives of indigenous people. And of course, we see this every day across the country in the recent report on Joyce Echaquan that if she were white, she would be still alive and that she died because she was indigenous. Um, we see this in terms of the RCMP finally acknowledging that, uh, that they were not, uh, um, uh, that they were not fair and uh, in terms of how they treated uh, Colton Bushi's mother. 
and uh, and on and on are the uh, the uh, examples every day. Now, um, I had a chance to review the TRC and the calls to action, and um, I can make some further comments about that. But um, you know, he makes the statement that it was the educational system that contributed to this problem in this country. And it's the educational system that's going to help us get away from it. And I'm not sure that we can do that without anti-racist education and a critique of white supremacy and colonialism. And um, just to conclude, um, I think uh, we need to return back to our, our, uh, our indigenous scholars who observed, you know, almost five decades ago that for education to be truly in liberating, it cannot take place within the present institutions and bureaucracy. Now that's interesting to think about decolonizing the academy. It will require more than placing native elites in the oppressor's position. Structures will have to be destroyed and new ones built that embody freedom and humanness as well as political power. And I think that uh, we would be um, wise to, to return to some of these original um, scholars who who make these kinds of observations, like I said, almost five decades ago. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, um, that uh, really thoughtful presentation. And I'm sure we're going to get a lot of questions, uh, Dr. Sandini. Um, at the moment though, we're going to move on to the um, to a talk by um, Dr. Shirley Ann Tate. Um, Dr. Tate is a professor and Canada um, Canada Research Chair in the Department of Sociology at the University uh, of Al Alberta. She's the uh, uh, CRC Tier 1 in Feminism and Intersectionality at the um, University of Alberta. Uh, and she is also an honorary professor at the Nelson Mandela University in South Africa. Her area of research is Black dias Diaspora Studies uh, broadly, and her research interests are institutional racism, the body, affect, beauty, hybridity, race performativ performativity, I'm sorry, and Caribbean decolonial studies, while paying attention always to the intersections of race and gender. So I'm now going to turn over the virtual floor to Dr. Shirley Ann Tate. Hello everyone. Um, thank you so much for the invitation to be here and for the wonderful introduction. I also want to thank Elder Colleen for the blessing and my colleague Verna for her teachings. I've learned a great deal in just the 20 minutes that you've had Verna, thank you very much. Um, so to begin my contribution, I've been developing my thinking for more than two decades, I think on race, racism, anti-racism, and continuing coloniality. And through this development, I have begun to label the work that I do, Black feminist decolonial thinking. It's not about making a grand gesture, but just to try to put my finger on what it is I'm trying to do theoretically and why it matters for the academy now. So let me try to put some flesh on what black feminist decolonial thought could be or might become. And at the same time, show some of the theoretical givens through which I, I can analyze the world and the knowledges and teachings on which I draw to confront whiteness as a structure of domination and specifically look at institutionalized uh, racism. Black feminism, of course, we know comes out of the US and it comes out of the UK, comes out of the Caribbean and Latin America. 
where Black feminism has quite a vibrant life. It also comes out of Black feminist politics in those locations. It also comes out of thinking of Blackness itself um, in terms of diaspora. It's not necessarily land-based then. It emerges within a Western hemispheric racial capitalism, which as we know, was and is marked by indigenous dispossession and attempted genocide, indigenous and African enslavement, and African Indian, Javanese, and Chinese indentureship and white settler colonialism. Blackness comes from this long history of the silencing of the African as human when the only possibility of humanness was white. Blackness also comes from political struggle, from maroonage, revolt, and civil disobedience when our claims to being human were silenced. We still see this today in hashtag BLM and hashtag say her name, for example, and also the reparations movement based in the Caribbean and multiple other campaigns against state sanctioned deaths in custody in the Western hemisphere. Continuing coloniality goes hand in hand with anti-blackness, which attempts to stifle any sign of dissent. For me, it is impossible to think decolonization without also thinking anti-racism. They're completely intertwined. They are inseparable. You see this idea about decolonization and anti-racism being inseparable in, for example, Jackie Alexander and Chandra Mahanti's thinking on third world feminism. We also see it in Aimé Césaire's um, discourse on colonization when he talks about thingification and disalienation. We see it in Franz Fanon's work on epidermalization also in Sylvia Winter's work on the human forged through uh, colonialism and also her writing on 1444. And going to the Spanish speaking Caribbean, we also see this in Yudirkis Espinosa Minosos and Ochi Curiel's thinking on indigenous sovereignty, anti-black racism, coloniality, extractivism and anti-capitalist struggles. But these are some of the currents in my work that, that helped me to, to, to think black feminist decolonial thought. We also see, of course, what the decolonization project could be in Toni Morrison's work playing in the dark because of her take on knowledge and what, what knowledge should be, even though she's not seen as a decolonial scholar. Another person not seen as a decolonial scholar, but whose work really helps me to think about um, the coloniality of affect is Audre Lorde, where in Uses of Anger, she tells us what to do in terms of effective politics and how effective they can be to build communities of resistance and other knowledges as well. So I see myself constantly as being in a process of piecing myself together theoretically as a Black uh, feminist decolonial scholar. So I draw on this toolkit, which keeps becoming larger and larger, of course, of Black feminist decolonial scholars and decolonial scholars as well. Um, do you want to put the first slide on for me, please? There, thank you so much. She says that she writes out of what she calls regions of the world, that is Latin America and the Caribbean, where modernity continues to be revealed as racist, androcentric, capitalist, imperialist, and Co uh, colonialist, where hegemonic Southern feminism is committed to hegemonic Northern feminism and coloniality. So she's doing a critique as well then of feminism as something that is still steeped in coloniality. And for her, this continues the history of colonization and dependency producing la otra de la otra. So for her, we have to decolonize feminism itself through drawing on thinking from black women, women of color and indigenous women that show that we still live within coloniality and its racist project of death and domination. So thinking anti-racism and decolonization as inseparable means that I have to envision the change I want to see in terms of knowledge becoming power and affect. 
the effective life of the micro practices of institutional racism is what I think I have introduced into the discussion of the need for social justice transformation in universities. So in effect, I look at the coloniality of affect and its impacts on a people, but also on institutions as well. So I look at affects like shame, disgust and anger, for example. In terms of becoming, I draw on the work <clears throat> of both Jaime Césaire and Franz Fanon, um, two Martinican, that is Caribbean uh, scholars, to understand how the epidemialization of anti-Blackness has been and continues to be challenged through uh, disalienation. That is, drawing from Césaire, disidentifying from being the object of coloniality to produce what Stuart Hall calls new autographies, new autography. I can't say the word, new autographies of the self, so new writings of the self through re-epidermalization. A phrase here perhaps will do by way of illustration. Black is beautiful, for example, or for Franz Fanon, I am a man. Can I have the second slide, please? Thank you. This is to do with knowledge. Toni Morrison in Playing in the Dark asks us first to go from being the observed to the observer, from object to subject of knowledge. She asks that we therefore interrogate knowledge systems and recast them through what for me are decolonial critiques. Um, Audre Lorde also asks that we think about the impact of feeling, the necessity for feeling um, as we go about our daily lives. That is, we need to engage how racism and oppression impacts us and use these to frame new knowledges and communities. And to go back to Toni Morrison, Toni Morrison also talks about knowledge in this way. She says that we should not replace one dominant knowledge system with another in a totalizing way. She also asks us to therefore think about the place for plurality in what we see as the canon. We have to develop knowledge clearly through critique of the institutions that we occupy and knowledge systems that we use and that occupy us are so beautifully shown by Verna in her talk. Can I have slide three, please? And uh, last, power. Uh, Black Latin American and Caribbean feminists like Euderkis Espinosa Minoso and Ochi Curiel, who are both African descendant feminists from the Dominican Republic, stress that we should not forget that the decolonial project will operate within a context of capitalism, Western modernity, and continuing coloniality. For Curiel, we must understand decolonization as what she, she says is the recognition of the economic, political, and cultural historical domination resulting from European colonization of other peoples and the effects produced by coloniality in our social imaginary. Decolonization for her is a political and epistemological position. And for me, I would add in affective position as well which traverses individual and collective thought and action, our imaginaries, our bodies, our sexualities, and our ways of being and doing in the world. This therefore necessitates the construction of other thoughts in accordance with our lived experiences. And I'd like to stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Tate, for, for that. Um, Just going to make sure that I'm unmuted here. Yeah, um, for that wonderful um, talk and some some great food for thought. Um, I'm just checking here to to see that we uh, whether we have some questions coming up. I'd also like to take the opportunity to um, have a bit of a conversation with you and with uh, with participants in the in the uh, webinar. 
And also if Elder Colin, Colleen Sitting Eagle, if, uh, if she's returned, if people would like to ask uh, questions of her. Um, we currently only have a few questions in the Q&A, um, but there is one question that I would like to, to start with while we're waiting for those. Um, and I'm just, I'm fairly new to, to webinars in the Q&A, um, the Q&A format. So right now we were just dealing with um, some tech issues in the, in the Q&A. Um, so the question that I have, um, I come as, as Melinda mentioned from um, a literary studies and indigenous studies background. Um, and my question is for either or both of you, which is, um, which is the question of how we, in, in decolonizing the university in particular, our classrooms, our teaching and so forth, um, what are the, the strong or wise strategies that we can bring into um, Asking, asking our, our colleagues, our students, the university itself to appreciate lived experience, to appreciate the realm of the effective um, rather than to deny it, uh, which, which I think has in, in the work that I've been doing in anti-racism in particular is always um, the, the, the difficulty in working within, within the institution. And I don't know which one of you would like to respond to that. You want to go first, Berna? Yeah, okay. Um, well, I, I am not sure because I think that, um, that we still need to observe the observations made by Shireen Razak, you know, almost three decades ago around like feeding off the tears in terms of like, you know, mm -hmm. our, our experience. So mm -hmm. I, I, I think that, um, or like uh, bell hook says, uh, eating the other. Mm. How do we resist those kinds mm. of uh, moves? And so I think it's it remains uh, important. And I think Rezac makes this uh, this uh, um, argument in her book, "Looking White People in the Eye," that you ha you mm. have to keep the focus on dominance. Yeah. And um, and that you know. That's part of what, you know, as challenging as that can be and unexpected for many students coming into a justice course, they come in thinking they're going to help the other. And then, you know, particularly if you're placed in a position of dominance, racial dominance, then to, to find that the course is actually on who you are and how is colonialism mm -hmm. and white supremacy, you know, maintained your place of privilege and advantage. Uh, at the expense of, of people who are racialized as brown and black. Shirley? Yeah, thank you, uh, Verna. Um, you're completely right. I totally agree with you. Um, I think also that uh, thinking about experience, you know, black feminism begins from that position. So I'd have to say that experience for us is is quite significant as as I as I mentioned, and certainly in, in like critical race theory and also critical race feminism as well, it's about starting from experience and starting from the auto ethnographic in terms of writing. But what does that auto ethnographic do? It doesn't do uh, what Werner was talking about displays of vulnerability in order to reassert white supremacy. It doesn't do that. What it does is it talks about what white supremacy does to us as humans, which I think is, is quite a different kind of uh, take on the position, you know, on, on thinking about like experience. And um, I've certainly found in my work um, that on like the effective life of racism in institutions, that for um, some people in the audience, it can be incredibly triggering. And it's similar to what Ver Verna was talking about, about people in the classroom who come in to do something on justice and then find it very uncomfortable um, when they have to think about themselves 
as implicated in white supremacy, but that's part of the unlearning of racism, which I think is absolutely vital. If that is never done, then we won't make any progress. Um, from what you've said about, um, surely that I'd like to follow up on that um, with a question from someone um, who, and, and maybe the, um, what you've been talking about, um, it's a simple question, but you know, uh, I don't think there are simple answers, which is no. what, what do you think <laughs> is the role of university students in all of this? Um, I find quite often in these mm -hmm. discussions, we don't, we don't privilege the voice and the perspective of students. And uh, so I'm skipping over a couple of earlier questions to ask, ask you that given, given what you've just said. Mm. Um, I wouldn't want to dictate what the role of students should be because I, um, I can only really speak about my responsibility as an anti-racist, right? Um, but perhaps students in general, because I think racism impacts everyone, all of us, we're all implicated in it. Um, all, all, all sorts of racism really. So I think perhaps students should also see it as their responsibility to, to speak about racism rather than feel, feeling that they have to be silent. But the problem is of course, students often are silenced in universities and in the classrooms by us as faculty, but also by the institution itself and the expectations of what a proper <laughs> a proper sociology student should behave like, or you know, whichever, whichever discipline it might be, and also what proper knowledge is in the different disciplines. So I think it's um, the role of students is is quite a complicated one because, of course, you know, if if um, if you become a student activist, a student anti-racist activist, you can also open yourself up to things like being expelled from the university. Um, right, having a lot of sanctions. So you really have to think about, I think, I had to do this, think about what my responsibilities are and also to what extent I can expose myself, what dangers can I expose myself to where it would still be safe for me to continue doing the work. So that would be what I would say. And the other thing I would say is we have to engage very actively in anti-racist coalitions that would be part of what I'd like my students to do. I, I suppose I would add to that quickly too, that, um, that being a university student isn't a homogenous category either, you know, that, that uh, there, there are different uh, levels of um, privilege and so forth that go, go with that. And that, that brings us back to the question of being an, being an ally that, uh, that uh, Dr. St. Denis brought up. Um, we I, now have some great questions. Um, the, Vern, I wanted going... to say something, sorry. Oh, yeah, I so, just... I'm sorry, Vern, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I, um, I think actually, um, I mean, I'm seeing uh, more and more younger students, the next generation come in uh, wanting more anti-racist education, wanting more anti-colonial, decolonizing literature and um and mm. we're at the U of S involved in looking at what's available across Canadian user universities particularly U15 and you know there's a in, an anti-racist course here and one over there but uh, very few places where you can uh, go and uh, and and gain a university education either at the mm. undergrad or graduate level and sustained anti-colonial, anti-racist mm. way. Mm. And mm. I just see that uh, graduate programs are, uh, particularly in colleges of education, there's just a real uh, shortage and limited uh, uh, kinds of course offerings and uh, even graduate programs mm. that, that provide you with, with that kind of opportunity. Mm. So I, I um, I, I know that uh, the uh, University of Saskatchewan um, students organization are, are lobbying for, um, for increased uh, education, actually, ironically, within a higher education. Um, 
and uh, they certainly see the need for uh, faculty to address their own racism. Mm. So, and mm. I think, um, yeah, there's always a risk in terms of in, in uh, student activism, but I, but I see as well um, uh, a, a growing acknowledgement and, and desire for um, non-Indigenous, Indigenous students to, to collaborate and, yeah. and work together. And yeah. I think that's a really positive. But I, I, I would say, um, I mean, I remember going, you know, when I went to Stanford 25, almost 27 years ago, in a college of education, a school of education being told, you're not, if you're interested in anti-racism, it's not here. You're not going to find it here. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I did find it in, uh, you know, the Department of Anthropology was, which was in the process of dividing between cultural studies and like the bio biologists in anthropology. And so, um, so that was a very enriching university experience, mm -hmm. but not in the School of Education. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I, I would say that's true here at the University of Calgary as well, that the, the, the impetus for change, particularly around anti-racism, um, is uh, we, we feel it more strongly coming from, um, from students. Um, although there's, I, I would say there's a lot of goodwill for all the problems that that entails coming across the campus community. Um, but but that that isn't necessarily doesn't necessarily promote either decolonization or uh, anti-racism on the ground, right? So, mm -hmm. um, so this this question I think is for um, for Verna, um, but I, it's certainly one that I think um, and either of you could respond to. It's the first question we got. Um, this is about the uh, definition of uh, the University of Saskatchewan has about uh, decolonizing and and decolonization. Uh, how and I'm going to read the question as it's been um, as it's been typed out. How is it that promoting indigenous knowledge maintains some academic distance? I fully agree with the rest of the statement, but I have a question about promotion, promotion or promoting. Um, I ask in the context of philosophy, as well as the academic study of religion, where there's a strong predilection to describe, analyze, understand and critique, but does not, but, but not the same kind of predilection to promote worldviews since this would be seen as proselytizing or perhaps indoctrinating. How is promotion of indigenous knowledge different? Mm. Oh, I don't know how to uh, respond to that question. I guess, you know, in terms of those kinds of words that were used to think about decolonizing, my, my, my uh, concern was that, how is it that, um, how much will change if we just get included into a system that's already problematic? And how will we, how will our indigenous knowledge get heard? Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, I think there's also some concern about how does it then get co-opted? And, um, you know, for example, I was listening to uh, two CBC radio station uh, a couple of weeks ago in which, um, um, uh, is it uh, Mary Hines who in, in her, um, Tapestry is interviewing um, the daughter of um, Carl Sagan, um, and she's she had written this book on ritual, and it just really struck me how um, how I mean she's talking about the value of, of of ritual, and then I was thinking about how indigenous rituals and traditions have been so maligned. Mm -hmm. And, and yet, you know, we have these, you know, high profile or, you know, you know, original insights being um, put forth by people like Rebecca, I think it's her Sarah Sagan. And then the other interview that I was listening to was by, on, um, by uh, uh, Eleanor Wachtel interviewing Richard Powers, 
on his book, what is it, The Overstay on Trees, in which he uh, comes to this, you know, his novel, he comes to the realization of uh, the impact of Western capitalism and, um, and, and how, you know, in this Western capitalist world, like accumulation and consumption are the values that drive drive people in a reconsideration of that. And again, I thought about indigenous knowledge systems and how um, like there's an acknowledgement of this um, climate crisis and indigenous knowledges have a lot to offer in terms of thinking about how we address that. Mm. And there's just been like a long history of indigenous knowledges being ignored. So mm. for example, you know, we heard in, in um, um, how the fires in BC this past summer and uh, a final recognition that maybe indigenous people and their knowledge systems have something to say about mm. managing fires. Mm. Um, and so the promotion of, um, I guess, the, you know, the promotion of Indigenous knowledge within the academy, <clears throat> I suppose, as long as there is uh, a strong connection between the Indigenous peoples for whom that knowledge belongs, and then how it gets operationalized. Mm -hmm. And so in terms of like pointing to some positive things that could happen, I was just recalling um, uh, a few years ago when I, I uh, in, in Toronto and going on the, um, the, uh, the tour, the big, big Indian yellow school bus tour in which it was a collaboration between indigenous people and, um, and archeologists about reclaiming the traditional historical pathways that run through the urban area of Toronto. And that was like fascinating. I could see that as one example of like a positive collaboration between the academy and indigenous knowledge. Mm -hmm. But I, I just find like too often I worry that uh, we get included into a system that's, that's oppressive. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have some great questions here. We're not gonna be able to get all, to all of them, but I'd like to take a question here by, from Maurice Manyfingers. Um, uh, so um, Maurice has said, good afternoon to both of you. Uh, excellent presentation. Um, many public institutions in Alberta are moving towards in, indigenizing um, their universities and colleges, it's certainly true of, of the University of Calgary and many others. Um, as president of Old Sun Community College on the Siksika Nation Blackfoot Confederacy, our indigenous colleges are already invested in the development of our own Blackfoot languages and cultures. What, what is your perspective on public institutions and their desire to move towards indigenization? Well, I think um, um, I, I support Indigenous institutions. And I think Indigenous institutions and Indigenous people in those in, in, institutions are the one who um, should be leading the way on reclaiming and restoring our Indigenous knowledge, our Indigenous mm -hmm. languages. Mm -hmm. and, um, and so I really, you know, I mean, Maybe here in Canada, like quote, tribal colleges are not as widespread, but in the US they are. And in Saskatchewan here, we have First Nations uh, University of Canada. And I, I really uphold those, those institutions as uh, a place where sometimes I, 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 I think, you know, that we just need our own separate institutions, our own separate public school and, um, you know, instead of expending all our energy, like trying to convince people in, say, schooling that, that, that our parents care about their children, that our children are capable of learning. It just gets tiring mm -hmm. trying to do that. So I just, I really um, see the tremendous value. And, uh, and I think actually maybe in some ways these 
colonial universities should be consulting with Indigenous uh, institutions about indigenizing. That's who should lead the way. Yeah, I actually have a, a hope it's a quick story to tell. I was um, the former director of our Indigenous Studies program at the University of Calgary. And we were approached by um, uh, an, an Indigenous uh, former college, um, now a university, uh, does university transfer work. And they, they have a program um, that's been ongoing for quite a long time um, where they offer, <coughs> where they offer doctoral level um, indigenous programming for, for students, and, uh, mostly indigenous students. And they asked, they, they came to us and asked if we would collaborate with them on this programming. Um, so we talked for quite a while and then we got a notice, a, a note from the president of, um, of the university saying, um, well, you are just way too colonial. We can't collaborate with you. So sorry, we're, we're going to dissolve the partnership. And it was, really, it was quite, it was quite a, it wasn't a wake up moment. It was, a, it was an obvious moment from my perspective, but it was really interesting to recognize that, um, that we simply couldn't go far enough within a university, a regular colonial university structure to, um, to engage with this partnership at that time. Um, okay, so this is something that I think is a really good question for both of you. Um, in, in, this is from Romain, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that, Khan. In pursuing the decolonizing of the Western university, how do we reconcile indigenous land-based approaches that Tuck and Yang espouse and perhaps the less land-based approaches to anti-racism? Are these even two distinct approaches to decolonization to begin with? Well, I, I think, uh... I think that there still needs to be anti-racism even to get access or to reassert ownership and sovereignty over yeah. land. Mm -hmm. You're still you're still engaging with whatever you know, wildlife management, forestry management, um, um, you know, uh, water water systems. You're still engaging with people who come with a colonial mindset to, and so I think. Um, land-based education and, and anti-racism education to me i i feel like anti-racism education opens the door for indigenous land-based and indigenous education mm -hmm. at least that's what students have shared with me over the years that the requirement that they take indigenous studies before they come into the college of education and then they come into the college of education and then many of them encounter me teaching anti-racism and and I've shared this before, you know, then some of them will come up and say, I wish I had this class before I had Indigenous studies. Because it helps me to understand the value and appreciate the value of the Indigenous studies mm -hmm. courses and content. So I think, I think, I, I, you know, I think they go together and they've been separated or one or the other. Mm -hmm. Shirley? Um, I've been doing a lot of learning about um, land-based approaches since I've arrived in Canada. So unfortunately, you know, I'm I'm not like um, very literate, I have to say, uh, on that topic. But having said that, I think um, that for me, one of the important things to to think about is. Um, what's been taken from us as people from the Caribbean mm -hmm. when um, our Indigenous forefathers were removed from the land, were killed. That is basically where our, our land-based traditions were removed very early on. And the only land-based uh, land positions we were then left with were the, was the land of the plantation from which we had to flee, if, if at all possible. So before I got to Canada, for me, land wasn't that significant, I have to say. But now I'm beginning to understand much, much more 
about the sacred nature of the land, the importance of the land in thinking. And somebody whose work has also helped me to do that in a way is the work of uh, Tiffany King, where she's talking, it's called Black the Black Shoals. And she's, she's doing a, um, thinking about the, the necessity for land-based thinking, drawing from indigenous studies within black studies. So I found that like a really generative text to begin, well, to continue uh, my thinking. And I think that the thing about talking about um, black diaspora is it does make it like Western hemispheric and not particularly linked to any land as such. But I think what Tiffany King shows is it's really important to think about land as well in terms of anti-racist work and decolonization for us as black scholars. Mm -hmm. Well, th thank you for that. I think one of the, the things that um, I've been discovering um, in, in the fields that I work in is, a, is both uh, productive and unproductive tension uh, around, um, around I'm, I myself immigrated here when I was um, in my early teens and um, finding, um, finding a way to, to articulate with my work with indigenous peoples, how to articulate uh, a sense of dispossession mm -hmm. uh, as, a, as an immigrant. At the same mm -hmm. time, it's recognizing it's not, if it's a land-based dispossession, it's a very different kind of, um, um, different around notions of sovereignty and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Yeah. which is what I'm learning. Thank yeah. you, Aruna. Yeah. Well, and I think, you know, like residential schools, that's what residential schools were, were about, was to, to, to sever that connection between mm. family, community, and land. Mm. Mm. And uh, that's what the Indian Residential School Settlement was about as well, was um, when the uh, Indigenous people are making their claims for um, class action suits against the federal government and tying uh, the practice of residential schools to genocide, but also um, making the claim that Indigenous culture is, 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 is land. And just a, a concern that um, you know that they might lose in 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 their in their legal system the mm -hmm. arguments that were put forth by these class action suits. That's why we have the settlement, and and I think that uh, that recognition of um, of you know reclaiming and asserting sovereignty over land has just really grown in terms of. Um, um, political action, but also in terms of education. Mm. And so we just see like a really blossoming of, uh, of a resistance to colonial K-12 education and a recognition of the importance of, of um, maintaining that relationship to the land. So for example, in our college, in the College of Education, we do have a land-based education program, master's level, that's facilitated and, man, you know, uh, organized by Dr. Alex Wilson, who's from Ochapways in um, on the border of Manitoba and Saskatchewan, in the, and um, yeah, and so there's uh, that program has graduated dozens by now of master's level people, you know, um, um, grounded in in supporting and promoting land based education and. Anti-racism has always been a part of that program as well. Yeah. I'm going to, because we're, we're coming fairly close to the end of our time here, I'm going to put two questions together and I apologize to the people who posted these questions um, because their, their connection may, may be clear only to me. So um, <laughs> one of them is a question um, from Joseph Gazingwolf about students in STEM in particular, where funding publications, all of those kinds of standards have, um, have a particular traction for academics and, and excludes people who work in indigenous communities 
who pri prioritize working within uh, working within their communities. Um, so Joseph has asked for strategies that might, uh, for STEM people working in STEM, decolonize um, tenure processes um, and other academic priorities. The other question came from someone who asked us how we could, in effect, decolonize our grading and assessment practices. Um, and I saw, I maybe incorrectly saw those as two connected questions. Well, um, you know, our system is set up on a meritocratic, like mer meritocracy. And, um, and so um, I've been looking at, you know, 20 years ago, it was really hard to find a critique of meritocracy as, a, as an ideology and also as a practice. But there are scholars now um, writing about, a, you know, critiquing meritocracy and, and, uh, and, and, and asking questions about what is it that we value do we value, uh, uh, um, you know, this um, uh, bringing in uh, research dollars, uh, a long list of publications, or, or, or might we start valuing uh, what it would mean to value character, being a good person? Mm -hmm. how, how, how would you assess that? And would, would, would those of us who work in, you know, indigenous community and, and uh, how could that become valued? Um, because uh, in terms of, uh, I mean, we just went through that the other day, um, assessing all our CVs and, and assigning merit. Mm -hmm. um, and um, yeah, I, um, I, I know that there's a growing critique of merit, you know, that practice. So I think, mm -hmm. I, I, I support that mm -hmm. so critiquing and in terms of like, yeah, STEM. And there's certainly that you see that evident there. Mm. Um, I, I just want to thank you, Verna. Um, I was gonna say something on meritocracy too. So it's nice that we kind of chimed together on that. Um, I think then uh, what I'd just like to say briefly is something about how quality is judged. I'm not from STEM, I'm a social scientist, right? But how something like judging the quality of somebody's publication is still an incredibly subjective process. And I'll give you an example from my own life. I like to do that, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, it took me a really, really long time in the UK to go from associate professor to full professor within the institution in which I'd worked for maybe 10 years. In fact, I never became a professor there because my work was judged not to be of sufficiently good quality, not international enough and not cutting edge enough to make me a professor, okay? So that was internally. Um, external to that institution, I was offered two professorships in the same year that I was told to withdraw my application for professor. So, and now here I am, a Canada research chair. Yeah, still the same person with just a few more publications under my belt and a bit more experience. So what I'm saying by that is um, the whole process <laughs> The whole process, like Brenner was saying, the whole process within institutions needs to be dismantled and really looked at. And remember, we make up institutions. It's the people that make up institutions. It's us who judge what's quality and what's not. It's also us that judge what's cutting edge and what is like at the forefront of the discipline. We do that. So we, first of all, need to decolonize our own minds on that a bit too, I would say. I'll stop there. Yeah, I mean, I could see some connection to uh, this book by um, Markovitz on the meritocracy. Uh, at first, I wasn't sure about his argument, but he uh, he makes this argument that um, uh, meritocracy harms the elite for whom it benefits. 
it harms the elite by um, by um, by how it it dominates their work, and so it impacts. Uh, what does he say? In, in their work interferes with their health, prevents them from forming strong relationships with their children, gets in the way of good relationships with their spouses. And I thought, oh, that's that's interesting, you know, because definitely have experienced that myself too, in terms of the sacrifices. In fact, my mm. grandson asked me one day, do he said, do you, and he was about five, maybe when he asked me, do you love your work more than me? Oh. So I'll soon be retiring. <laughs> anyway, I, I think these are uh, really important questions. And then, you know, the idea of, of uh, collaboration. I mean, I don't think it's very easy to collaborate in the academy the way it's set up now yeah in fact it discourages that yeah, yeah. Well, and 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 i would say in terms of the person who asked about the grading mm -hmm. and assessment i don't think we really had robust strong conversations about equity and inclusion particularly in in uh, changing assessment practices really at any level, you know, whether it's assessment of, of uh, professors or students, because uh, particularly grading is something that many of us who are faculty members hold pretty dear, like our grading practices. So, but there is material out there, there's research out there about it. So, um, but we are now just at the end of our event. And so I would uh, deeply like to thank um, uh, Dr. Tate and Dr. Saint Denis for, and other um, Sitting Eagle for their uh, participation in this event. Um, I see that um, uh, Elder Colleen has been uh, typing answers to some of the questions. So I hope uh, some, some of you got those. Um, and I just want to let people know that our next Courageous Conversations webinar will be in the new year. So stay tuned. We'll be continuing the series with um, um, the, 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 these, the series on anti-racism and decolonization in the university uh, later. These discussions are difficult. They're really important. They're transformational and they're needed. So for all the participants, your willingness to be part of this, these discussions matters, and it is what we need to, be, to build the momentum of change. Thank you for your wisdom to the panelists. Thank you for your openness and some great questions today for the, to the participants. And all of you, thank you for being with us today. For more information on our Courageous Conversations series, please visit our website at ucalgary.ca forward slash equity uh, I can't find it, equity-inclusion, um, or you can just, which, which is what I do, I just Google um, OEDI uh, on the UCalgary website, um, and even working in the office, that's my, my go-to um, mm -hmm. way of getting there. Um, and I think that's it to wrap for today. Um, again, just a, a, a final thank you to the panelists and our elder for today for joining us for this great conversation. I know we had a lot of participants and there were many who would have come, but today is also the signing of the Scarborough Charter. So a lot of people were uh, there today. Thank you very much. <laughs>